tonight, a historic fisheries protest that delays a provincial budget and sparks a Supreme Court injunction. We're not here for anything else but to get treated fairly. I got kids, I got everything to go. Go What is unacceptable is violent protests. The budget was canceled. And I got a funny feeling that it may be canceled again tomorrow. No one wants 500 people to be arrested tomorrow morning. This is CBC Here and Now. Good evening and welcome to a special edition of Here and Now. We plan to bring you highlights from today's provincial budget, but that's all been postponed after hundreds of protesters flocked at Confederation Building and blocked civil servants from entering. So we're dedicating this evening's show to that developing story. There were angry flare-ups, physical confrontations, even some injuries. Finally, the courts got involved, but still no certainty tonight on whether there's a path forward for the fishery or a plan for the government to present its financial blueprint. So we have extensive coverage tonight, beginning with Terry Roberts at the Small Boat Basin. So Terry, take us through what happened today. Yeah, well, Carolyn, look, it was probably one of the uh, ugliest displays of civil unrest that we've seen in this province in a very long time. We know now that seafood harvesters, well, they've been protesting for the last two weeks. So they're demanding that the highly regulated uh, seafood industry in this province that had be thrown wide open. So, and, but it all boiled over today. Look, on a day when the provincial finance minister, Siobhan Cody, when she was supposed to unveil a $10 billion financial blueprint for this province. They arrived in darkness before six this morning. Hundreds of angry seafood harvesters and their supporters, first easily passing through a police checkpoint, then up the steps of Confederation Building. On this side, he's going to take a walk with me. Everybody on this side is going to hang out here. From there, they peeled off in smaller groups, blocking building entrances, preventing thousands of public servants from going to work. Six twenty-five, the first flare-up. Some protesters made a dash for a rear entrance, the same entrance used by politicians. They were met by police, including the RNC's mounted unit. For about two hours, a fragile calm. Even the police chief was on the front line, while some workers were upset by the interruption. So today, when people are on open line complaining about how they didn't get through the government, that's on your shoulders. You're a selfish group of individuals. Have a nice day. Have a nice day. Eight twenty. The RNC tries to open a corridor into the building for a group of workers. Some protesters strike and pull at the horses. It's not clear if any of the workers made it through the gauntlet, including some of the province's top bureaucrats. The protesters held the line, and the police eventually backed off. But not before this man, Chew Cove fisherman Richard Martin, was injured. A broken hip, it was later reported. He was taken away by ambulance. And so was this police officer, also injured in the melee. Then another ugly incident. A senior aide to the premier was pushed back as she tried to enter the building. The fireworks comes just weeks before the opening of the annual crab harvest, the province's most important fishery. Harvesters say they've been pushed into a corner, that a small number of processing companies wield too much power, telling them when they can fish and who they can sell to. The uprising is being led by this man. We want our business back in our own hands. Hey! Harvesters want to see more processing licenses issued. They want restrictions lifted on some plants that have a cap on how much they can buy. And they want to be able to sell their catch to companies in the Maritimes. We're not in here joking around. We just want to get this fixed once and for all and be treated like every other industry, you know, in, in Canada. Something happened today 
that have never happened before in the history of Newfoundland. The budget was cancelled. Now, one group we haven't heard from so far in all this is the uh, Association of Seafood Producers. That's the company. That's the group that represents all the companies that uh, that buy, process, and sell all the crab that's landed here in this province. Well, that's about to change. We just learned from them that they're going to hold a news conference tomorrow morning to give their rebuttal to all this. And tomorrow is the big question. So what's going to happen tomorrow at Confederation Building? Well, I'll throw it back to Peter Cowan, who's there right now, for more on that front. Peter? Well, Terry, the scene here this morning was very different. There definitely wasn't this calm, and that's why myself and other members of the media politicians were not able to go in and that's why it was a budget day without a budget in fact the andrew fury's 10 million dollar sorry billion dollar spending plan is going to have to wait for another day and today at a news conference he made it clear he was frustrated about this what is unacceptable is violent protests and so some of the behaviors we saw today will not be tolerated by me or our government we have a budget to deliver, one that is important for 530,000 Newfoundlanders and Labradorians, one that delivers on promises of health care, infrastructure, education, roads, fishery, and much, much more. The Premier also insists that they're not just listening to the harvesters' concerns, but addressing them, taking a number of steps in advance of this year's season to try and increase that competition that they're looking for. For example, he says they're willing to allow outside buyers. Whether that's outside buyers, we've said yes. Whether that's incre increased capacity, we've said yes once we get the tack. Whether that's a fulsome review of corporate concentration and for foreign ownership, we've said yes. So where does this leave the budget? Well, the Premier insists he wants to move forward as soon as it's safe. So could that mean tomorrow? What would be different? Well, there is one thing. Today, the province got an injunction. They're free to protest. They're free to express their uh, voice, their opinions, their views. Uh, but they're not free to prevent individuals, whether it's public service workers, workers at the House of Assembly, or politicians who will deliver the budget as soon as it's safe to do so from entering that premises. So to be clear, protesters can still show up here on the steps tomorrow. They can voice their concerns, but if they try and stop people from entering the building, they can be arrested. So we'll have to see what government decides to do. Protesters today insisted that even with that injunction, they still plan to show up. They still plan to block access. But now that comes with the risk of arrest. Reporting live in St. John's, I'm Peter Cowan for Here and Now. Right, what they done. I was I was sat in the chief of police. I introduced him to me where I was and where I was from. Anyway, he said we got to keep the peace now, dog. He said we got to keep peace here today. And then all of a sudden they done this. So a buddy came back out again. The police, chief of police came back out again. And he said to me, he said he walked the land. I said what happened? I said well, I thought we'll keep the peace here today. He said we tried. I said he done it. We didn't push. He pushed us. That's one harvester there speaking with reporters saying he thinks the RNC went too far at today's protest. Before that, you also saw a government worker getting tossed about in the crowd while attempting to enter the Confederation building. Both a protester and police officer were injured today. That injunction that Peter mentioned will prohibit anyone from blocking the entrance to Confederation building tomorrow. And the premier today made it clear tomorrow is when he wants to table the budget. Well, we're going to uh, work with uh, the Department of Justice and Public Safety, uh, or the RNC, to, to ensure that there is a, uh, a safety plan and measure. So uh, it is our intention uh, to uh, proceed with the budget when it is safe, the first available time, um, hopefully, for the benefit of all Newfoundlanders and Labradorians, that is tomorrow. No one wants 500 people to be arrested tomorrow morning. What we do want is to have continued dialogue with the leadership of the FFAW. Well, today's disruptive protest comes after a series of demonstrations in recent weeks, and it's the latest in the province's long and fiery history of fish harvesters trying to get their concerns heard by government. Here now is Mike Moore has that angle. So you don't live near the water and you have no connection to the fishery, and you're wondering what just happened. So this happened. 
The question is why? The short answer is money. Like past fishery protests, the long answer is tangly. This is last year, a disagreement over the price point for crab led harvesters to tie up their boats for weeks instead of hitting the open water. But this year's protest isn't about price, and it isn't only about crab. Harvesters and the FFAW want what they're calling free enterprise. They want to sell any species they can to any buyer they want, whether that's inside the province or outside. At the last minute, Fisheries Minister Elvis Lovis bent a bit. The government did commit to searching for outside buyers, but only for the snow crab fishery. But the push and pull between harvesters and government didn't stop the push and shove from happening today in Confederation Building parking lot. So the provincial budget is still tied up for now, and the government is trying to tie up protests with a court injunction. In other words, still tangly. That was Mike Moore reporting. Well, they came from all over. Some drove for hours to attend today's protest at Confederation Building in St. John's. Let's head to the Northern Peninsula now, where fish harvesters say their bottom line is being destroyed. Freelance reporter Leila Baudouin was on a wharf in Port Saunders today speaking with fishermen. I can't do nothing. You're just, you're just told you got nothing to catch. We haven't got enough of crab. Anybody who eat crab, not enough to make a good sandwich for them what we got to catch. Longtime fish harvester, 70 year old Benedict Lavers, says the numbers haven't been adding up for years. That harvesters like him are desperate for better policies. I don't want no big paw. Give me seven or eight times a month of or five or six times a week. Let me go fishing or something. Give me some halibut to catch. I'm better now with not enough of halibut to make a good pot of stew. So, uh, that much halibut, 16, 1700 pound of halibut, enough for a 45 foot boat. Three or four people. I know what the hell you want to do with the leg of that. The writing is on the wall in many fishing towns where they've been struggling to budget each spring, where delays and tie ups mean no money to pay the bills. The man is working, feeding them people. Man, that fishing boat 24 7, dragging his heart out. That's who's putting the, paying the taxes in them people for to feed them. But they don't understand that stuff, eh? You know, we're fighting, but same thing, sometimes the same thing. It always seems like a losing battle. Anchor Point deckhand Miles Galton says he's in the same boat, tired of a broken fishery that doesn't add up. And, and every year it seems it's getting worse. Now we get out of our shrimp cut, cuts and everything, and, and so you know, what, what are you going to have left to go at? What are you going to do with those boats? You've got owners who got millions of dollars spent into it, and you got to pay crews, and you got to buy grub, you got to buy fuel. So, I mean, after a while, you just got to go. You, you can't stay into it. From boats to fish plants, there's a flow of money in risk of collapse. But for most, it's a job and a livelihood that no longer makes sense, with questions on where decisions are made and who pays the price. Whatever goes on in there, that brings it all back to us. That works, comes right down the point line to us, to the fishermen here, small fishermen. I'm here now, I got none. I've been fishing boat for 50 plus years, now I'm here with none. I've got none, not a pound of none fit to go make a living with no more. And I always made a good living, and now I can't make it no more. Both Lavers and Galton should be gearing up for a peaceful retirement. Instead, they're watching what's happening in the parking lot at Confederation Building, wondering what comes next. Leila Baudouin, CBC News, Port Saunders. There's going to be a lot of outport communities in this province. It's going to be complete ghost towns. So describe the, the scenario for you that works for you in this fishery. <laughs> A lot of changes. Well, we're not finished with this story yet. More coverage from today's protest at Confederation Building that's ahead on Here and Now. And in the weather forecast, it's going to be a fairly quiet night, but things really get going tomorrow with rain changing to snow for the east coast of the island. Look at it here. It's going to bring a lot of rain to the Avalon Peninsula. We'll talk about that and more coming up.
This weather update is brought to you by the Healthcare Foundation Home Lottery. The bonus prize deadline is midnight, Friday, April 12th. Order tickets now at hcfhomelottery.ca. Well, Heather, quite the news day today, but uh, weather-wise, things were very calm and very quiet in St. John's. Yeah, absolutely. A nice day in St. John's today. Tomorrow uh, might not be the same story for for sure. Uh, current conditions in St. John's. Uh, now that we can see the harbor game and that we've got the light now that it's the first day of spring, really, two degrees feeling like minus four winds from the west at 30 kilometers per hour in St. John's. Not the case yesterday, though, in Twillingate, smashing a temperature record 6.1, the new record, smashing one from uh, 2016, the old record 4.7 degrees. Taking a look at today's highs, reaching that six degrees there in Badger, as you can see in five in Corner Brook, two, three, four for the rest of the province, really, or for the island, excuse me, but uh, along the north coast of the island, around the freezing mark, also around the freezing mark through western Labrador, a uh, touch higher there through central Labrador and into the freezer, into the coast of Labrador. Cooler there, of course. Talking about the weather that is on the way now, we're going to have a cloudy night. We will see a chance of flurries for central parts of the west coast and the northern peninsula. Tomorrow, it's going to get started. Snow changing over to rain. Then on Friday, we could see a few flurries. Quiet weather tonight, as Carolyn and I were just talking about, clouds for the most part, and you can see a band of flurries here across central Newfoundland, parts of the west coast that's going to move on up to the northern peninsula. And then tomorrow, this is going to be our weather maker right here. Snow changing over the rain, really affecting the east coast, staying with us here for much of the day into the evening for the Avalon Peninsula, and the snow is going to work its way up into southern Labrador. So that will be in the weather for you on Friday. Taking a look at some watches and warnings, we're going to see 25 to 35 millimeters of rain in a rainfall warning for much of the Avalon Peninsula. And tomorrow we have a wreck house wind warning in effect. Taking a look at tonight, though, for the island, your temperatures are going to be from minus one uh, for the southwest coast here, Port of Basque, up to minus eight for the northern peninsula. Partly cloudy to mostly cloudy skies for the island for the most part with those flurries there through central Newfoundland. You could see them through St. Anthony and the Straits as well, possibly in Lab City. Not much to talk about when it comes to the wind tonight. Uh, Westerlies up to 40 for eastern Newfoundland. Taking a look at tomorrow, again, we're just taking a look at that future tracker here. And uh, we'll start out with snow, but then by lunchtime tomorrow, it's looking like it's going to have its transition to rain on the Avalon, still snow on the Bonavista Peninsula and starting to transition down on the boot. And that, again, will stay with us through much of the day and then work its way into Labrador. For the winds, again, tonight, not much to talk about. Fairly nice night, but they're going to steadily pick up as this system moves towards us tomorrow. Uh, 75 there for the southwest coast, 60 on the Avalon, and uh, inching a little bit higher tomorrow evening. So that's when the party really gets started there. So tomorrow, taking a look at our temperatures for the east coast, four to six degrees for the Avalon for the most part, that rain changing to snow. We'll see two to five centimeters for the Northeast Avalon, followed by five to 15 millimeters of rain for the Southern Avalon, a little less snow for you folks, but more rain. You see the 15 to 25 millimeters during the daytime, three degrees for the Bonavista Peninsula and four for Marystown on the Buren Peninsula. As we inch to central Newfoundland, temperatures between one and two degrees for Central, for Grand Falls and Twillingate and Terra Nova. Uh, and things will start to taper off here. We'll see five centimeters for Bonavista, followed by five millimeters. And then for Conagra, we'll see about two centimeters of snow. So really the system affecting much of the East Coast. As we get to the West Coast, we could see snow or some rain for you folks. Winds from the Southwest gusting up to 50, two, three, four degrees for you folks. Cooling off by a degree or two for the Northern Peninsula, one and two, your day Daytime high tomorrow have some wind chill values to contend with for the northern peninsula though in the morning and into southern Labrador where we could see a flurry through the straits possibly in St. Anthony and Mary's Harbor as well up for the rest of the big land uh, minus six for Nain nice day for you folks and around the freezing mark for the rest of Labrador happy valley goose bait three degrees though looking like a nice day with some flurries for you folks I'll have your long-range forecast a little later in the show
Thanks so much, Heather. Well, let's return now to today's top story, the delay and disruption of today's provincial budget. Hundreds of seafood harvesters blocked the doors of Confederation Building today in St. John's. Our Terry Roberts was there at the crack of dawn speaking with fish harvesters about what they're looking for and how frustrations have finally reached a boiling point. We're not looking to close down any plants. We don't want to close plants. I don't want to see plants go to business. I do not want to see plant workers. We need, we need the plants. We need the plant workers. All we're looking for is fairness, free enterprise, that you can make a deal. You can deal with the company. You're not being told who you're selling to, how much you're getting paid for, how much you're going to bring in, when you're going to bring it in and what you're going to catch. We're not in here joking around. We just want to get this fixed once and for all and be treated like every other industry, you know, in, in Canada. What's the tipping point that brought it to this level this year? Well, I guess to basically, you know, before we were getting by, the prices were doing well. And then last year, well, we all know about the, you know, it was a catastrophe. So we, we went in the end reluctantly and fished should hope to rebuild the market. You know, you're hearing some, you know, reports out of Nova Scotia where they're getting paid upwards of four bucks this this year, and they're talking about us getting another two fifty. So, you know, we know we're down in the rabbit hole now, and, and and we're locked in. We have no one else to turn to. I mean, we got four or five buyers essentially, or five or six that you know basically owns the whole industry, and you can't even like, you know, I don't owe no money to any processor, but I can't turn around tomorrow and go out and leave my plant and go to another plant. So that's a problem, you know. Why can't you? Why can't you sell to anyone you want? Because they're in, they're, they include together in their own association, so if, you know, they won't take each other's boats on them. Okay, I get it. Because, you know, they're, they're essentially friends now, right? Before they were competitors, and the, you know, and the Liberal government seems to be really behind that, like, you know, supporting that idea. Let's just make five or six people extremely wealthy and let the communities die. I drove five hours for the coming here. Right, so what... what people what here have drove further than that, like... Enough is enough. Like, it's time for you to make a stand. Yeah, that's why we're here. So describe a scenario for you that works for you in this fishery. <laughs> a lot of changes. Government, a little more backing from them would be nice. But when they got processors, got them all bought and paid off, funding their campaigns, we don't stand a chance. No, we got nobody on our side. How far are you willing to go today? Oh, we're going all the way. Oh, yeah, this is now or never. It reminds me of the, the <coughs> basically the merchants back in the Florida yes. fishery. Right where the merchants had their big house on the hill and everybody else was struggling. And so in actual fact, we have you not have really, house on the hill. we, we yeah. haven't really moved, no. right? We haven't True. really moved past that. So what's happening is the fishery, the, the, the men and women who go out fishing is in the, same same, in the same boat as it was back in the day when the merchants controlled everything. Well, darling, right? we, we, we've regressed even farther than that. At least, there, at least there was, uh, there was an abundance of companies here in this province that you could sell your product to. I'm going to leave mine in the water. If I got only one buyer to sell my product to, it will stay in the water. And, uh, and, uh, and there's going to be a lot of people like us. We, uh, we, we have one of the richest resources on the face of this earth around this province. And the only ones that's benefiting from it is the processing companies. The ones that risk their life to go out on the water, day in and day out, is bringing their, bringing their product in, they got one buyer. And if that buyer says, well, we'll give you a dollar a pound this time, then next week you'll go out and they'll say, well, we'll, only, we'll give you 50 cents. With the price of uh, fuel, food, and licenses, and, and your crew members, there's just no way that you can make hands meet can tell you that it can get very heated. Uh, in the case that I was involved in, I remember looking outside my window and there were fish harvesters climbing trees. Well, it's not the first time our political commentator has seen a disruptive fisheries protest like this, but it's never disrupted a provincial budget. We'll dive into it with political science prof Alex Marland just ahead.
Well, rather than watch the finance minister hand down this year's budget, Premier Andrew Fury held a news conference today to address what he called a rowdy fisheries protest that forced the shutdown of the Confederation building this morning. Here are a few of his and Justice Minister John Hogan's comments to reporters. There will be a budget for the people of Newfoundland and Labrador, full stop. I understand uh, that uh, there was an injury that occurred uh, with a police officer and my thoughts and prayers are with him and his family and wish him uh, a speedy recovery. I also understand that uh, several public uh, officials felt threatened and intimidated today. And let me say, uh, first and foremost, that that's unacceptable. And my thoughts are with them as well. I am uh, profoundly disappointed uh, today that uh, the behavior of a few uh, could uh, take over and jeopardize a budget that is for the entire province. They have entirely uh, the democratic right uh, to peaceful protest. And that is something that we encourage. And as leaders, we should all encourage in the democratic process. What is unacceptable is violent protests. And so some of the behaviors we saw today will not be tolerated by me or our government. We have a budget to deliver, one that is important for 530,000 Newfoundlanders and Labradorians, one that delivers on promises of health care, infrastructure, education, roads, fishery, and much, much more. Community groups waiting to hear if they have their funding available. So we intend to go ahead with this budget. It will be implemented. I got kids, I got everything else. Go f yourself. First and foremost is everyone's safety. Um, certainly, I, I'm, on the, I'm on the understanding, having talked to people who work in the public service this morning, that they didn't feel safe. Obviously, you've all seen the videos, and some of you were there this morning, that they didn't feel safe going to work. Uh, the Department of Justice uh, took the step this morning to go to court to ask for an injunction. Uh, and that injunction was granted, I think, maybe less than an hour ago. I, I think some of you have probably seen the copy of the order from Justice Stack. Uh, that injunction will prohibit individuals from blocking safe access. Uh, to Confederation buildings starting right now. Uh, so any individuals that are there uh, that will be subject to that injunction will be uh, will serve with that. So they'll have notice that, as the Premier said, they're free to protest, they're free to express their uh, voice, their opinions, their views, uh, but they're not free to prevent individuals, whether it's public service workers, workers at the House of Assembly, or politicians who will deliver the budget as soon as it's safe to do so from entering that premises. Some of the videos that I've seen, punching horses and assaulting individuals, that, that's unacceptable. And uh, the police uh, had a job to do, and uh, they will continue to do it. No one wants 500 people to be arrested tomorrow morning. What we do want is to have continued dialogue with the leadership of the FFAW. Well, as we've been seeing, this has been an unprecedented day. The provincial budget delayed due to that rowdy protest outside the Confederation building. Alex Marland is a political scientist at Acadia University who spent years in the political science department at Memorial University. Alex, thank you so much for joining me. Hi hey there. Now, our original plan was for us to talk about the potential political fallout from today's budget, but we're going to park that conversation for now. So let's talk about today's protest. I know you experienced something similar when you worked in Confederation Building back in 2005 as a communications director for fisheries and aquaculture. Uh, the legislature was shut down then. Can you tell me how does today's protest compare to those days? I mean, one thing immediately for me is the instantaneous video that exists. So back in 2005, people didn't all have uh, smartphones in their hand going around recording things. Um, journalists weren't necessarily able to hustle as quickly as they can now and have somebody with a camera available to record things. You know, some of the video that I've seen was frankly, I found, you know, on the one hand, it, it really drives home the message that fish harvesters are really upset 
Um, there's absolutely no way that the government could have proceeded with its budget. People are unable to enter the building. There's the risk of violence and you know, all sorts of frustrations. On the other hand, I think that some of the video that came out was actually quite disturbing. I saw one video of uh, the Premier's communications director. Frankly, what I felt was, uh, you know, being bullied and harassed by a big, uh, a big man. And I just don't think it's a good look for anybody when a big man is harassing a woman. There's a long history uh, of, uh, you know, the fishery being a hot button issue in this province. And you certainly saw that firsthand during your time um, in Confederation Building. Can you kind of take us back to that time? What do you remember from 2005? Well, I remember the, the deputy minister at the time saying uh, a quote that's always stayed with me, which is there's always a racket in the fishery. And basically, you know, the, the, in the public service, Every spring, they're always prepared for some sort of disruption. Everybody's always concerned about setting the price for, uh, you know, the product that's going to get landed. Thinking back to the way things were back when um, the Danny Williams government was trying to advance what was called the raw materials sharing program, I can tell you that it can get very heated. Uh, in the case that I was involved in, I remember looking outside my window and there were fish harvesters climbing trees, hanging posters. Uh, they eventually ended up breaking into the Petten building. Uh, they ended up causing all sorts of damage. They turned on, you know, water that ended up leaking downstairs. Uh, when we went into a room the next day, uh, the minister's portrait had been taken off the wall and had been smashed. Uh, there was garbage everywhere. It was, it was really, things were really broken up. Uh, but that's when they got access to the building. I think the question here is uh, very different because now we're not talking about, you know, the Petten building, which is for fisheries and aquaculture. Uh, in this particular case, we're talking about the legislature itself, which happens to be seated within the bigger government building. And, you know, the reality is the government budget has to proceed. And that's why a judge has issued an injunction. You know, it's fine to make your point, but the reality is you can't hold democracy hostage. Mm -hmm. And budget day is almost a sacred day in politics, right? There's always so much hoopla around it. How unusual is it to see a budget day postponed like this uh, in, in the last minute? You know, viewers might remember something, but I don't. I mean, to me, this is just not something that uh, is, is normal. Uh, you know, a budget is almost sacred ground. Uh, you know, it's just one of those things in the parliamentary calendar, uh, the speech from the throne would be another, where we just sort of have a, a level of reverence to understand that there's a, a certain process that has to play out uh, where people follow and respect this process. And that includes uh, the media, all the journalists being brought in for a lock-in so that they can be briefed on things. Uh, the finance minister, um, you know, very much preparing for a speech. And often what happens is there's a bit of a media blackout leading up to it where government will not be releasing all sorts of news because they don't want to interfere with leaking little details out uh, or keeping all the focus on the finance minister. And all of the government, and when I say the government, I mean the public service, is essentially seized at the moment saying, okay, everything we've been working for is leading up to this point. It's a huge moment in the parliamentary calendar. And so the idea that it's delayed is really a disruption. And this is, you know, from my perspective as a political scientist, Fantastic. They've made their point. Uh, it's absolutely appropriate now that uh, the budget be, is brought forward because it involves a lot of other files other than what uh, these protesters are concerned about. And of course, the public is watching all of this unfold, too. They may not know the intricacies of, of this conflict between government and the harvesters, but, but they're watching. And what do you think this does for the Fury government politically? Like, Do you think that it hurts them in any way, or could it even help them in terms of public perception? Uh, I would think in the short term that the fish harvesters have achieved their goal, which is to, you know, push their issue up to the fore. And so in politics, it's a lot of things are about agenda setting. And if you are not leading the news, your ability to get the attention of politicians is lower. So they've accomplished that. It puts a lot of pressure on the Fury government to try to find some sort of resolution. I think the question is, how long do the fish harvesters go along with preventing uh, access in some other way? Um, so they, you know, obviously they're going to respect an injunction, but are they going to find other ways to try and keep this in the fore? I mean, I think, you know, the advice that uh, unsolicited advice that I would provide to the Fury government is find a mediator, find some way to, uh, you know, get this out of the public agenda where there's cooler heads that can prevail, where there's, you know, some sort of 
talks that are going on and people might say, well, they've tried that and it's failed. But the reality is that you have to diffuse this. You have to be able to reduce the temperature on it. Um, but the bottom line is uh, for the Fury government, they're also not talking about other things that could be causing uh, difficulties. So every day that this is in the news is one less day that people are raising the concerns of the homeless. It's one less day that they're talking about carbon tax and all sorts of other things. Well, Alex Marland, uh, it was certainly a surprising, unusual day. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts on that with us. All right. Thank you, Carolyn. I've always been influenced by uh, some really great band teachers through the years, different programs and stuff, so I knew that's what I wanted to do. Well, coming up, we'll meet Sarah Comerford, a local music teacher nominated for a Juno Award. The fish harvesters protest today has echoes of what is arguably Newfoundland and Labrador's most famous series of protests. The 1992 closure of the cod fishery, which led to clashes between harvesters and politicians and the iconic moment between John Crosby and fishermen on a wharf in Bay Bulls. Now the stakes are different. The setting of fish prices in Newfoundland and Labrador is actually excluded 
from the Federal Competition Act. I've written the Prime Minister, I wrote him last year. There was a review of the Federal Competition Act. I asked the Prime Minister, please include, include fish pricing in your review, in your changes uh, to the legislation. I didn't even uh, get a reply. Even if the changes that the fishermen want uh, in, in terms of uh, expanding the number of licenses, in terms of lifting the processing cap, uh, in terms of outside buyers, even if all those changes are brought in, fishermen would still not have free, uh, would not have free enterprise. Because in, in the absence of free enterprise, we don't have free enterprise. We've got a legislated system of, of fish pricing in this province that, 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 tilts, that tilts the balance of favor on the side of the processors, not the harvesters. So even, with, even if the, the fishermen get exactly what they want, it's, it's still not going to go far enough. We also need a complete a review of uh, controlling agreements where uh, processing co companies control um, uh, inshore enterprises. That needs to be reviewed. There's, all, all, there's already been a federal House of Commons uh, uh, committee uh, recommendation for that to happen. And uh, from our perspective, in the absence of free enterprise, uh, setting the price of fish, uh, the provincial government, uh, with their legislated, si legislated system, has to guarantee inshore harvesters, the inshore fleet, a fair market share. It has to go that far. Okay, let's switch gears now and introduce you to a local music teacher who's up for a Juno Award. Sarah Comerford is one of five music teachers across the country nominated for their work with kids. Here she is talking about her passion. <laughs> My name is Sarah Comerford and I'm the music specialist at McDonald Drive Junior High School. I've always wanted to teach. My dad was a band teacher and uh, I've always been influenced by uh, some really great band teachers through the years, different programs and stuff, so I knew that's what I wanted to do. I dabbled in composition and other things, but um, I've always enjoyed teaching kids and I think that especially this age group is really important. You know, the kids come here and they've got a couple years of experience under the belts and uh, you can start to do more things, have more fun musically and really start to see them, shape them and grow and I enjoy this age group. So yeah, I've always wanted to work with kids. And Corona Brophy uh, called in December or November about nominating me and, and it's a fair bit of work to put these packages together, nomination packages, so I didn't think it was going to go anywhere, you know, so it was interesting when I did get that phone call, I was like, oh, that's really neat. Um, I mean, I'm not unique, there's lots of people doing really great stuff in schools, lots of fabulous music teachers around, but it is very cool to, um, I guess, big knowledge for the work you do. Ms. Carford's an amazing teacher, I couldn't think of anyone more deserving of it, I'm very happy for her. It's nice to have some representation in Newfoundland, and it's well deserved too, you know. I, I just think it's awesome. My, my whole family is so happy because my, my sister also, she also taught my sister and for band, and she's really happy about it too, and my brother is probably going to come and play band here as well. Just the sense of community that Miss Comerford has built in band, you know, I just feel like, you know, rather than band just being a subject in school, I feel like we're really a family here and we're all connected when we play music together. You know, it's not just here coming to play music, it's also socializing and making friends and all that stuff. Sometimes you'll be practicing at home and then you'll realize that like if you were playing it with the band it would just be so much more fun because it's just this like feeling when you come here that you're just gonna like have a blast. What do you say? The studio. Right. So what would you associate with that? Like let's put a picture to that. What do you think? Yes. I think it's really important to talk to them as musicians especially this age. I know that you know Growing up sometimes you would just be reading notes on a page and responding to them and it's all very important but here you know we really try to talk more about the music and how we can represent it and what kind of things we can think about when we try to make it so you know building those building blocks to their own musicianship talking about the music engaging them in the conversation about it you know that's what we try to do that's what I try to do as much as I can.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, here's a milestone for you. March 31st marks 75 years of Confederation. It was in the late hours of that day back in 1949 that Newfoundland joined Canada. On the 25th anniversary, a provincial songwriting competition was held. It was a chance to immortalize the young province in song, and many young people jumped at the chance. Have a listen. As part of the Confederation Jubilee Song Contest, this is Willie Arsenault from Kellegrews, and it's called Rub a Dub. A rub a dub, a rub a dub a dub, with the soap that floats, a rub a dub a dub. Newfoundland probably has more songwriters for its size than any other province. 87 entries from a population of just a half million people. The format of this station has been expanded to include the best 14, still in the running for Song of the Year. I'm a Newfoundlander, and I'm proud to say, on this little hunk of rock, I was born and raised in a little town called Fortwood, a seaport on the coast. I pick up on the map, but to me it is the most. I'm a Newfoundlander. More than 60% of Newfoundlanders today are under the age of 25, but their music reflects a heritage of yesterday, a connection with their ancestors, English and French, Irish and Scottish. We're so proud to be Newfoundlanders. We give a cheer to ourselves. Aside from the fun involved, there's a $1,000 first prize, and who knows, perhaps an immortality thus far reserved for the musical authors of The Squid Jig and Ground and Eyes the Bye. Bill Mitchell, CBC News, St. John's. Oh, I wonder now who won. I just mm. love those archival pieces. So nice just to see little pieces of our past. Yeah, 1974, <laughs> my goodness. All right, so from the past to the future, long range forecast, uh, some rain coming. That's right. Tomorrow we're going to have some snow followed by some rain here in the east, snow for other parts of the province. Mm -hmm. Looks like we'll see uh, flurries or a chance of them sticking around uh, Friday into Saturday. So let's take a look at what's on the way. Uh, you can see here that we'll have a lot of that rain over much of the island Thursday evening with that system that Carolyn and I were just talking about that's going to bring the snow and then the rain. And as we go into Friday in the overnight, it'll really be bringing some snow to southern, central, and western Labrador. Don't worry, Northern Labrador, it's on the way for you too as we move on and you can see that snow pushing up as the system leaves us here. Uh, so on Friday, what that will mean is a lot of cloudy skies for many parts of the province. We will see uh, flurries or a chance of them for many places in St. John's. We've got a little sun icon there so we can see a mix of sun and cloud and possibly a chance of flurries there as well. Three degrees, a little bit cooler further west in Gander and and uh, Marystown at one and two respectively. We will see some flurries through central there and the west coast as well possibly uh, looking like we will see uh, some snow and some windy weather for Nain there you can see at minus three so not a great day for you folks there. As this snow starts to uh, push north and away from the island on Saturday what will happen is some clearing in behind that and then we will see a little bit more sun. So zero for St. John's and for Marystown, sun and cloud for St. John's and for Gander there as at four, zero for Marystown. Picking up some flurries though uh, for the southwest coast and the west coast at minus one. Some more sunshine up through the Straits and Cartwright there as well and some flurries possible for Happy Valley Goose Bay and for Nain and for Lab West, minus 11 in Lab City. You look 
looking like the cool spot there on Saturday. Taking a look at our long range now. Uh, Thursday for the east, that's going to be our sloppy day. Possible flurries Friday, Saturday looking nice, but a return of some precipitation for Sunday and Monday. In through central and western Newfoundland, we see a lot more gray there on the screen. Uh, Thursday, Friday for central looking like you could see flurries Saturday looking, you know, not bad. Sunday, it looks like you could have a mix for central Newfoundland and some flurries again on Monday as you begin your work week. For western Newfoundland, again, we'll see a bit of mixing there on Thursday. Flurries for Friday, Saturday, some mixing on Sunday and flurries again on Monday. It's more like sprinter than spring, isn't it? <laughs> So for Western uh, Labrador, it looks like we could see a chance of flurries with some sun on Thursday, some flurries possible on Friday. Saturday, Sunday, Monday, not looking too bad. Things clearing off, but getting cooler for you folks there. For Eastern Labrador, a similar trend. The sun will come out uh, Sunday and Monday, it looks. Now, this is our weather photo of the day. Oh, beautiful. Isn't it? Yeah. If you didn't see that snow in the background, it could be positively tropical, couldn't it? <laughs> it it's could. a sandy beach somewhere nice and warm. That comes to us from Julie Bags, and it was taken at Sandbanks Provincial Park. And if you have any photos to send to us, you can do so at nlphotos at cbc.ca. Oh, just gorgeous. Thank you so much for that, Julie. Really appreciate it. Well, it was an interesting news day today, and I'm sure tomorrow is going to be interesting. We still don't know yet if uh, the budget is definitely going to go ahead tomorrow, mm -hmm. but the Premier has said that he's hoping uh, to do the budget tomorrow, so we'll wait and see about that. But we are expecting to hear from the Association of Seafood Producers, so that will be interesting at 10 a.m. tomorrow morning. And um, we're also hearing that protesters are going to be back at the Confederation Building at 6 a.m. tomorrow. So lots more to talk about tomorrow, and I hope you'll join us. Good night.